Good evening, and th thank you very much for joining us uh, on this very sunny evening uh, for our Steps Travel uh, webinar on Asia. Uh, my name is Justin, Justin Waterage, and I have the, the pleasure of trying to navigate through these, so how should we say, choppy waters that we're in at the moment. Um, but I'm very pleased to be joined by Sally, uh, Sally Ann Walters. Uh, Sally is our Asia team manager and also CLO, which is Cheshire Liaison Officer. Uh, and also by Jared, Jared Kite. He is our CEO, um, our Chief Experience Officer, and also CTO, Chief Testiculating Officer. <laughs> now, Sally and Jared will be running through about 30 different slides um, from around Asia, trying to answer some of the questions that you've already kindly sent to us. Um, if you haven't, uh, if, you, if there's a question that arises or there's something else you want to ask us, uh, please do use the chat function, chat function uh, to send through your questions. Um, I'm just going to do a quick overview of where we are. Um, Steps Travel, like many other tour operators, uh, we're the pinata. Uh, we've been hammered by, by governments at the moment. Uh, the UK government, its blunt instrument of quarantine, its U-turns, its lack of strategy. Um, as a result, we're having to be very creative and very flexible. Uh, we're having to, we're working hard to update our website uh, regularly with, with where to go now. Uh, and there are some great places, not least Turkey, um, but also working in terms of our booking conditions, being as flexible as we can in terms of payment terms and going forward so that you can book something for whether the second half of 2021 uh, and feel confident that your, your, your monies are safe with us. And again, that's all on our website and we will be sending out an e-news early next week about that. So that's enough from me. Uh, and what I'd like to do is hand over to Sally, if I may, first of all, uh, just to give you an update on some of the countries uh, in Asia uh, and where might be opening up and when, possibly when. Sally, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, Asia, well, it's sort of where, where it all kicked off, unfortunately. Um, and at this stage, it remains um, pretty shut. There aren't many, well, there are no tourist visas being issued. Um, but we hope that things will change soon. We had a colleague recently at a virtual, what's called Parter, it's one of the trade associations. They were talking to all our partners on the ground recently and the, the feeling is that we're looking at Chinese New Year, which falls uh, towards the end of February 21. It's a huge, um, host, um, host, a huge holiday for regional tourism. And so I think that that's the goal, that's the aim. They wanna get up and running for them, ideally. Um, state-of-the-art testing as we've seen in Singapore and places like that that we hope that we'll start to see things opening. Some tiny green shoots just always bear in mind that, that the visas aren't available but what we're seeing for example in Japan um, they're now issuing work visas, business visas and things like that. So they're, they're starting to let people into um, Vietnam often follows Japan um, and from around I think yesterday um, they're allowing eight more Asian countries to come in. Thailand are going for the long stay tourist market. Um, they're hoping to do a, a sort of 30 day Phuket visa um, from October, but you know, again, that remains to be seen. Thailand have worked really hard to keep their COVID numbers down. Cambodia, some of you may have read, they, they're charging a $2,000 sort of deposit when you get in there and that covers all your testing, your overnight stay on arrival. Um, and it gets held and it's refunded once you've had all this initial testing. Um, Indonesia, um, that's somewhere we're hoping, we really were hoping it was going to be opening this week. I would have liked to have been able to give you some really good news, but it's now looking up um, early 2021. Bali will be the first place to open inevitably. And then Sri Lanka, um, again, we were hoping to have good news for November, but um, one of uh, our sort of journalist friends has been talking sort of into government and hearing things that are perhaps it's going to wait till next year. They ask for a COVID free, a COVID negative test on arrival, and then you get tested as you go through, which may or you know could have a bit of an impact on your trip. Good news story though, the Maldives, and we can talk a little bit about that later, but um, you can actually go, um, ideally would like the government not to quarantine you on the, on the way home because there's no cases there really, certainly not in the resort. Um, there's, you just need to take a negative test with you. Some resorts will test you on arrival, but um, Otherwise, you're free to enjoy your holiday and you're also free to go to other um, islands whilst you're there. Etihad and Emirates will test you before you fly home, but that can be done in the comfort of your, of your swanky resort, so not too um, uncomfortable. 
so that's a sort of green shoot that we're um Thank, thank, thank you for that. So I think that's uh, very comprehensive. And uh, as I said, thank you. Um, Jared, I had, had a quick question for you that I think Jackie, Jackie, Jackie Chatham asked before we uh, came online about group trips uh, and what might be happening about group trips going forward, uh, more in terms of social distancing. Um, yes, that wonderful oxymoron that I think the government came up with, um, social distancing. Um, we've been really, really encouraged by the level of interest in our group tours throughout the whole sort of COVID crisis, actually, it hasn't really waned too much. There's still an interest there. So consequently, you know, we've been in close contact with our partners on the ground with regards to our group tour portfolio. Um, Lara, um, who looks after that side of our business, has been working really hard um, in keeping those communication channels open. The main things really we're looking at are transport, now, sadly, we will need to use larger vehicles, which I say sadly is because, you know, let's be honest, that's not the most environmentally responsible thing to do. But if it means we can keep people at a safe distance on the vehicle, then you know, we're going to do that if we've got a group of, say, 12 plus um, that we need to keep distanced. We're also going to be looking at restaurants that have outdoor seating um, and um, obviously all the hotels we use, whether you're traveling as a group, um, or um, privately will be thoroughly checked to ensure that they are implementing you know, the new sort of standard operational procedures to keep you and their staff of course safe. So um, yeah plenty of work going on behind the scenes to ensure that you can travel um, in yeah, with a good sort of peace of mind. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so I think that, that the transport and accommodation will be a little different but I think one of the joys of travel, which is experiences, they won't change that, that much, whether it be the smell of incense in a temple, uh, whether it be great landscapes and sunlight, uh, such as here in Bagan, the, the, the image we're looking at now, uh, or the smiles of the people. And I know, Sally, you're a huge fan of Indonesia uh, and certainly some of the experiences that you've had in Indonesia. And I, I wondered if you could just tell us a bit more about Indonesia and some of its experiences. Yeah, thanks. Um, I am a big fan, um, been um, a good handful of times. Um, Indonesia is, as you all know, um, an enormous archipelago. I mean, it just stretches for on and on. Um, and it's hugely diverse. It depends really what you want out of the trip. I'm a big fan of Indonesian culture, but again, it varies from island to island. Um, Java being one of the main islands, and obviously where Jakarta is, is just this lovely long island of lush paddies. But then you can go in and find the most iconic temples like Borobudur um, and the wonderful university town of Yogyakarta with its artisans, its silversmiths and actually Pambran temples there also. A joyous thing to do is to take the train through Java and you can pop over to Bali then on a, on a local ferry. Um, don't, but don't ever think that Bali is not worth visiting. I mean I like it because I like a vibrant, um, a vibrant scene but you can just get off the beaten track and there's moss -colored, covered temples that you wouldn't know were there. If time allows and, um, and you've got enough people to fill the boat because much like a villa, a private boat, if you put the amount of people on it that it sleeps, it's actually surprisingly like, affordable. Um, but if you had the time and you just wanted the freedom to plan this sort of amazing dreamlike itinerary, um, in our summer you could sail from Bali right through to Komodo for the dragons, stopping at Moyo, Stopping, stopping at Sumbawa, um, where you can see uh, dive with whale sharks with Conservation International, finish off with those iconic dragons um, at Komodo National Park. In our winter months, you could do Radarampat, which has been in the press quite a bit pre sort of pre this crisis, um, but underwater it's pristine and, and I mean like nothing else. Um, and above water, you've got remote little spice islands and. It's just, it's magical. It's not many people there. And I think if you, if it was your thing, if you're a diver or a snorkeler, you just want to see something a bit different in our winter months, the boats move up. You can top and tail that with um, out towards, um, on the way from Bali, there's this wonderful resort called Nihi, which was opened by some San Francisco.com millionaires trying to find a place to put their surfboard. And now it's this most sublime resort or Mizul in Rajarampat, which we talk about here in the office as being at absolute benchmark for conservation and ethical tourism um, so you can have a bit of a land base it really comes down to what you want to do but 
such diversity but a boat if you can if, you, if that's your thing magical so, sorry there are a couple of questions about sort of the best time of year to go yeah. to indonesia so indonesia um the majority of indonesia is good in our summer months um in you know the sort of the komodo the bali java etc really the only place that really it becomes better in the winter is rajrampat and um, we have a lot of clients who want to see the orangutans and why wouldn't you want to go up to Tanjung Putin National Park and, and, and see orangutans in the That's the summer. Um, so the summer for the majority of Indonesia is, is the summer, spring, summer, autumn. You, you mentioned uh, Tanjung Putin National Park and orangutans. There's a question beforehand from uh, Martin Spahn about ecotourism. Yeah. Uh, and is it supportive of preserving the orangutan population or is it counterproductive? Uh, and I would urge Martin to perhaps join one of our orangutan trips with uh, Ashley Lehman and the Orangutan Foundation UK uh, and see the amazing work that the, they do on the ground uh, and and how the ecotourism is uh, very much a, a force for good, yeah. uh, certainly in terms of the orangutans. Um, you mentioned uh, one place that I would love to go to, and I saw, and I saw Jared nodding away there as well. Um, and I don't know, Ni Ni Hawatu, uh, and Indonesia had, has this sort of uh, amazing beaches and amazing sort of uh, marine life. Um, but so too the Maldives. Um, and I was wondering whether you could uh, whet our travel-starved appetites in terms of tell us a bit about the Maldives and, and maybe where you would like to go in the Maldives or, or where I could go. Yeah, quite. Um, absolutely. I mean, it's a funny thing. The Maldives, I think, are a little bit marmite, aren't they? For some people, being stuck on this island is not their idea of fun. For me, <laughs> it's at, it seems like heaven to have. I mean, I've got young children. They can run around. There's no cars. They can swim. If you don't know, Sally's one for sybaritic pleasures. That's definitely her. That sort of sensuous luxury. That's that's that's, okay, that's Sally. Right. I forgive me, but I think having been you know locked in a small Cotswold house for the last six months, this is my idea of heaven. But um, the Maldives. Yeah, <laughs> yes, true. The Maldives has got. I mean, you've got to like water, you've got to really want to snorkel, you don't have to dive, but you've got to not mind being on an island. Um, but personally, I think how heavenly and seaplanes, great fun, even if you're not a fan of flying, they're really fun. Um, some good family resorts, some wonderful um, sort of more ethical, sensitive like Como Malafushi, the Como at Six Senses, lots of wood, lots of they haven't disturbed the island too much, being very careful with reef management. So it really depends on what kind of makeup your party is, honeymoons, families, friends. There's some really fun islands like Niama and places where there's quite a sort of cool vibe going on, if you like that sort of thing. Thank you. Um, you I mentioned travel starved in sort of my intro into, into the Maldives, and it's uh, obviously been a, a disappointing, a, a frustrating year in terms of travel. And I know that you are uh, particularly disappointed, Sally, because you were due to go to Japan. Um, what was it that you were looking forward to about Japan? I, I, yes, I was due to go to Japan in March and then ironically I was due to be going to Japan, well I was due to be there now, um, I was meant to go at the weekend, just gone. Um, what I was looking forward to in particular um, was just the, the complete change. I mean I was lucky enough, lucky enough to have gone to Southeast Asia but not so to the north really. Um, I wanted to see this huge clash of new and old, um, the technology versus the history. But I really wanted to get myself, whilst doing the classic, I wanted to go and see places like Takayama, which is bursting with merchants' houses and little secret sake um, distilleries, or down to Kanazawa, home to all the gardens full of maple trees and things like that. Just sort of getting off the beaten track a little bit. It's the Japanese Alps. Um, as so a place that I'm, I'm not very good at pronouncing, but you go by bus just away from Kanazawa, and it's all these beautiful old houses made with um, no nails with, to withstand the snow of the Japanese app. So just getting away and seeing those little gems, Kyoto, of course, and Osaka. Um, I think we think of Tokyo, and we think of all the food and the vibrancy, but surprisingly, Osaka is the food capital of Japan. Um, and I was really looking forward to going on a sort of sneaky walking food tour, certainly around there and the trains i'm not a huge fl fly, fl fan of flying as i said so the joy of being in a country where you don't have to get on a, do any domestic flights um even just for convenience be fantastic great thank you um i think japan's population is 126 million um its size is some 30 365 square kilometers so there's 347 people per square kilometer 
Uh, in the UK, our population is 68 million. Uh, our geographic size is 242,000 square kilometers. So we have 281 people per, kilom uh, per kilometer in the UK. Uh, in Mongolia, um, their population is 3.3 million, of which I think a third live in UB in the capital. Uh, and that's over a massive area of 1.6, I think, uh, million square kilometers. So the Mongolians have two people per square kilometer. No. Um, I think I've answered my own question. But Jared, why do you like Mongolia? <laughs> <laughs> give me space, give me space, give me lots of lovely space. Mongolia has it by the bucket load. And I think you know, Asia is synonymous with the mega cities, Tokyo, Bangkok, Beijing. Um, and we forget perhaps that you know, Asia has some incredible, beautiful, remote wilderness and, and no more so than in Mongolia, which is almost sort of a byword, I think, for, for remote, um, for, for off the beaten track. And uh, you know, a lot, we talk about luxury travel a lot. What does luxury mean to you? And I think for me and, and a growing number of our clients and other people I speak to, um, space is the luxury. And I don't mean space travel sort of Captain Kirk style. I mean, finding remote wilderness, like in Salta in Northwest Argentina or in the Namib Desert in Namibia. Um, I went to Mongolia. Thank you, Nadia. The next slide would be good. Um, I went to Mongolia a few years ago um, and saw for myself just how much beautiful, pristine space there is. And I think the, the poem there that is a, a, a local Mongolian poem sort of sums it up, really. Um, I think whilst Mongolia has all this space, for me, what is important about it is, is the people that you meet. And, and that's what Asia is all about. It's meeting these fascinating people um, that have such rich stories to tell. And the first place that I went to was to a place called Jigate, which is right on the northwest part of Mongolia um, and upon the border with, with, with China. Um, and Chigate, we found out about through our partner, who's a real innovator working in Mongolia. He's looking to try and protect this area, to give it protected status. And it was just one of the most bucolic, most beautiful, untouched areas that I think I've ever been to. And it was one of those days where you know, everything just seems to be in sort of high definition. It was like we were stood there looking at this lake. Um, watching these herdsmen round up their livestock and it was as if we we're watching it on a high definition screen the, everything was just crystal clear the sound was really in sharp sort of sort of surround as it were and um, as I say a couple of horsemen were there sort of rounding up their livestock um, and as we got closer we realized that these horsemen I'll scratch my nose Nadia um, is they were um, herdsmen there and it was a, a father and son and um, they, they jumped off their horse. This little lad could have only been about 10 years old. Um, and um, having got their sort of livestock sort of settled, they, they got off their horses, laid down in front of this lake, um, you know, sort of on their elbows, just looking out across at the mountains. And it just struck me as the most perfect sort of scene of, of sort of father-son contentment. And um, you know, also just knowing that just the other side of those mountains was China. That, that to me was really sort of beguiling as, uh, as well. Um, so lots of great people you meet out in Mongolia, out in the steppes, and certainly people like, like this chap here, a Kazakh eagle hunter. Um, you know, this is a tradition that goes back over 2,000 years. Um, he, Burgal is this guy's name. He would have got this eagle as a chick, um, and he had this eagle probably for about eight years now, and he trained it. It took about six years for him to tame this huge bird. We're talking six or seven kilograms of, of bird here took him about six years to tame the bird. And then when the bird is 12, always a female, she'll be released, repatriated to the wild so she can grow up and have her own chicks and, and sort of help sustain the, the tradition of eagle hunting. The best time to see the eagle hunting, if you really want to see these, these men and the skills they have with their birds, is in November. And I'm sure Justin will um, confirm and it is an exceptional thing to experience. He was there in November at one of the um, eagle hunting festivals that you can visit um, out in the Altai region. So lots of people you meet along the way. Thank you Nadia. Um, for example this fella here, you know we were right out on the steps as you can see wide open spaces and from a long way off we saw this horse coming you know, it was the horse that allowed Genghis Khan to sort of unlock the keys to his empire. 
Um, so the horse is, is a part of, of, of everyday life out here on the steps. And um, this chap came along and, and got talking to our guide, got a cigarette, and he really took our meeting with him as a really auspicious occasion because he'd been to the Lama the day before to pray for rain because it, there was a drought and his livestock were dying. They'd had a really hard winter. Um, and as you can see, the clouds were re really gathering there. And, and this chap, by the time he left, had a big smile on his face because he felt that his, his, his visiting the Lama, his meeting with us, was a sign that his look was going to change and that the rain would come. And it was very, that's very much the sort of nomad way that you know, the belief that tomorrow will be a better day really propels that sort of nomadic lifestyle. Um, so lots of people we meet, met out on the steps. Um, this is um, a lovely um, lady, real sort of matriarch in her, in her um, yurt. And is it a girl or is it a yurt? Well, if it's Kazakh, it's a yurt. If it's a Mongolian um, tent, then it's a, it's a girl. And we were sat in the, the northern part of the, of the, um, the yurt and um, were given sort of traditional food, some milky tea and some bread with some sort of salted yak butter. And as you can see, the more eagle-eyed of you, the traditional um, tube of Pringles there as well, which is um, yeah, very typical uh, out on the steps. Um, but just that fabulous hospitality that you get when you're traveling. Um, that was a very warming, warming afternoon that we spent with this family. Um, and it isn't just people out here, there is wildlife as well. And we actually support the Altai Institute, which is a conservation body based out in um, Colorado, actually in the US. Um, and they work with our partner on the ground, trying to get Chigate, that area we looked at first off, protected status, um, and also trying to preserve, to conserve the, the um, snow leopard. Um, and this is a, an image taken on their camera traps travel with steps to Mongolia, you can go out with the researchers and check the camera traps. And we actually are now offering people the opportunity to go out and help try and collar a snow leopard um, out in the Mongolian steps, which um, certainly would give you some bragging rights over dinner. Thank you for that. Um, I know you said in terms of the eagle hunting that November is the best time to go because it's sort of the snows and, and that's when the eagles can sort of see their prey on the ground quite easily. Um, there's a question that came in from Beth Jordan about uh, when else is the best time to visit Mongolia? So either uh, either on the snow leopard trip or um, uh, just, just out and then to see nomadic life. Yeah, it, it, it's summertime, our, our summer, Northern Hemisphere summer. So really sort of May through to sort of July, August um, is the time um, because that is when you will get those beautiful big blue skies. You get the buildup of cloud as well because there will be some rain. Um, at that time and um, you'll see the nomadic people moving um, they're setting up their summer camps at that time and um, and people are generally um, happier at that time because it's less hostile you know I, I perhaps over romanticize the life of, of a nomad um, but let's not forget the fact that it is a very hard life that these people live and in summer it gives them respite from from you know the, the cold and the winter what can be very very harsh a land of extremes, well, uh, and the whole continent continent is a, a continent of extremes. I love one of the many reasons I love Asia is, is its diversity. It's very different landscapes. Uh, it's very different peoples. And I think if you think from the sort of the vast expanses of these uh, uh, the plains in the, uh, the steppes in in Mongolia to the patchwork of paddy fields that you, you get in Indochina, um, I love the French saying the uh, of Indochina, and they said the Vietnamese grew rice that the Cambodians watch rice grow and the Laotians listen to rice grow. Um, apart from rice, Sally, why should I go to uh, Indochina and in particular perhaps Vietnam? Because there were a lot of questions beforehand about Vietnam, so that's why I, uh, I just want to sort of emphasize on Vietnam. It's, um, well, again, it, we're talking about these huge and diverse experiences, you know, that you can go to Cambodia and you're in amongst the Siem Reap and the, and the Angkor Wat, I mean, and the fuzzy street scenes and things like that. And then actually a few dr hours drive down to the Cardamom Mountains and you're zip wiring into a, a jungle tent and then down to a, a beat. Um, Lua, as you say about the, you know, about Laos, it is much slower. It's slower to develop. It's slower when you're there, but as a result, it's pretty memorable. It's just opening up to tourism, really. And many people may have been to Luan Prabang but beyond that, people are just starting to venture out. There's some 
you know, you've got to be careful, you've got to plan and because it doesn't work as well in Laos as it may do, may do in Vietnam. The, the thing I would say about Indochina is don't try and do it all in one trip. Um, you can tack on, you know, a, a, to see Angkor or Luang Prabang, for example, but really try and choose your destination. Cambodia is becoming much more standalone. Vietnam, long and thin, as you probably know. Um, and you, I find the North much more like Northern Asia, more Chinese in feel, and even in, in the weather, then you go down to the, the middle or the demilitarized militarized zone, as it once was known, down to Hoi An and Hue, and then down to the South, which has a much more Southeast Asia feel to it. It's much more humid, much lusher. Um, the weather, if we, people are interested in that, it's very variable. You won't get a good season throughout the whole, if you did the whole um, country, you would get various seasons um, whilst you're there. Um, northern Vietnam has probably got, um, hard to say the most interesting thing to do, but probably the, a bit more gritty. You can go up beyond Hanoi, which obviously is fabulous and, and fascinating, but go a little bit, go on the train up towards Sapa, not necessarily, you can go a bit further, so you're away from the main busy areas if you want ethnic tribes of walking, things like that. Um, Halong Bay, for example, you don't want to just go into the main Halong Bay. You want to go, maybe if you've got time, have two nights and then you just get away from it. You can take your own boat and you get all the hidden coves and things like that away from the day flippers. Um, Phulong, Phulong is, um, is an, an, a rainforest, one of the few ancient rainforests up in that region. It's not very glamorous to stay there but the views and the walking are sublime um, and so that's really worth considering I mean just that northern area up from Hanoi is well worth considering when you go and I think Vietnam for that reason should really be treated as a standalone destination and invest the time in it. Great thank you um, there's a question about from Beth Jordan about um, again the, is it right to go during this pandemic but as you said at the beginning many of these Southeast Asian countries are, are not yet open uh, they may perhaps towards later this year or early next year. Um, and they, like, uh, well, countries around the world, will have very specific uh, measures to yeah. protect clients, guests coming there, uh, and, and also it, it, its own population. Um, I, well, we talked about rice, uh, uh, rice being a staple of Vietnam, uh, but so too India. And I was just reading today that India has the largest area of rice of, as a country uh, under cultivation. Um, but it's not the largest producer because China is the largest producer. Um, Jared, I know that you love your food. Um, so was it rice that drew you to India? Um, it wasn't rice. Um, no? no, it was a, a cheap ticket with STA, who sadly no longer with us. Um, but um, it was the first time I went traveling was to India and it has left an indelible impression on me um and um you yeah, created a wanderlust that i'm still trying to sate um i think a.a a. gill inevitably put it better than anybody in saying that you know, when he was asked what's the most exciting place you can go to on the planet he said that uh, nowhere provides you as much rapture for your rupee as india and um, i think that's right you know it's a country with a capacity to elicit feelings of sort of rapture and bewilderment really in, in equal measure um, it is dazzling it is bewildering it is complex it can be overwhelming um, it can be chaotic but it is never ever dull and it is a country that really celebrates its heritage in the most sort of dynamic and animated way whether it be through you know the preservation of some of its beautiful ancient sites like Am Hampi here on the, on the top left um, on the Deccan Plateau um, or some of the beautiful palaces in the bottom left there in, in Jaipur, um, or, or whether it be through you know, its people and the festivals that you can go to, some religious, some non-sectarian, um, you know, there is always a sort of manifest reminder of India's traditions and its heritage is when you're, when you're traveling through the country. And let's not forget, of course, also the, the natural outstanding beauty and I put that slide in there on um, Havelock Island in the Andaman Islands um, a place that um, many of our clients have been to and absolutely loved. Um, one of the big draw cards for me whenever I travel however is wildlife and I think you know for a country like India 
there is no better symbol in terms of a wildlife symbol of the country than than the tiger you know this fearless um sort of um resourceful um and and such a strong animal um i think it is the perfect symbol of india sadly it is also the poster boy for endangered animals all over the world it is still hunted um for its fur um, it is hunted for its body parts to be used in traditional medicines um, and um, you know, it is under threat because of the encroachment onto its natural habitat by India's burgeoning population. But you know, there is good news. So there was a census done at the end of last year, or rather the middle of last year, um, which showed a 33% increase in tiger numbers in India. Now, there was a certain amount of skepticism when these numbers were released. Um, some people felt that the increase was really down to more accurate uh, methods of, 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 of testing the population or, or measuring the population. Um, but I think for me, it, it is a positive thing. I think, you know, if a, if a country the size of India with its burgeoning population sort of, you know, bursting at the seams can actually preserve and conserve an animal like the tiger, um, then I think that it shows there is hope for endangered animals all over the planet. Um, and there's no question that sustainable tourism, responsible tourism has a really key role to play in helping with that effort. You know, it is no coincidence that where you find the most tigers, you will also find the best run parks and the most tourists. Um, your know, tourism provides, I think, eyes and ears on the ground to, um, to put a spotlight on poachers wherever they may try and operate. But crucially, it provides a mechanism by which local people and the governments, local governments can monetize their wild areas and their wildlife. Um, and that ensures that they are still given a chance. Um, it isn't just about the tiger. Um, you know, we, we, we try and encourage our, our, our clients to be less tiger centric. Um, but at the same time, we'll do what we can to try and help you see that tiger. Because I don't think anything really prepares you for seeing a tiger in the wild. It is It has to be one of the highlights of, of any sort of wildlife viewing. Best places to go? Well, there are many. Rantambore is now really considered to be a good place to go. You know, rewind five or six years ago and numbers were, were not so good. R numbers in Rantambore now um, are such that they're actually relocating tigers to different parks around India, um, they're that good. And they're opening up some of the buffer zones around the main core areas um, to, uh, to allow the animals to sort of dissipate and spread out. Um, other great places that I love, Kana National Park is, is beautiful. The, 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 the trees and the forests there um, are, are the most perfect landscape for seeing tigers. Um, I also like Todoba in the state of Maharashtra. Definitely the best place to try and say if you're trying to perfect your Sean Connery accent. Um, but Todoba, what Todoba has done really well is to offer um, experiences and activities other than tiger safaris. So you can go out on boats, you can go out on walks, you can go and check camera traps. Again, just to take the pressure off seeing a tiger because what that can often do is it puts a pressure on the guides and the drivers and they start breaking the rules um, in the parks when it comes to their driving conduct. And that's, that's not a good thing. Um, but um, you know, Madhya Pradesh is the main place to go and see tigers. The best time is at uh, the end of the season, sort of March, April. Um, but the season does run through from sort of September, October through to March, April. And whilst the beginning of this season, sadly, is not going to happen, we're still holding out hope that we may be able to get some of our clients out to uh, to India in sort of February, March time um, on, on tiger safaris. And we're really urging our clients to look ahead because we are finding that because of a lot of postponements, um, capacity is, is, is limited for later in 2021 and 2022. Um, other wildlife um, elephants in, in Kazaranga National Park, you can also see the, the, the um, Asian one-horned rhino in Kazaranga, um, right up in the northeast of, um, of India. I put the little biking shot in there as well because that's a trip we can offer people where you can bike between Kana and Pench in the Tiger Corridor there. Um, is it safe? Well, yes, it's fine as long as you can um, bike as fast as the slowest person in the pack. That's no problem. And I just wanted to put in the snow leopard.
um, without question, one of my favorite animals, the ghost of the Himalaya. Um, and of course, um, being seen now with more regularity than ever before um, in Ladakh, up in Uli, in the Uli Valley. Um, a remarkable animal, perfectly adapted to its environment. It's got these small little ears, so it, it doesn't have the extremities with which to get cold. You see that huge tail there, which enables it to balance on sort of cliffside edges. Also full of fat, that tail, so it's got fat reserves through the winter. And these massive great paws that it uses to get across the snow. The underside of the paws actually have fur on them to enable it to cling to the sides of cliffs. An amazing animal. And um, as I say, a lot of our clients over the last few years have seen snow leopards in Uli, um, have some great memories to share. Thank you for that. Um, there was a question from Alison Farmer about Nagaland, but before I go to that, I'm just going to uh, say to Stu, um, I have seen your question, but I will come back to it right at the end uh, under Q&A, if that's okay. Um, Alison was asking about uh, Nagaland because her father uh, served there during the Second World War. Um, uh, and maybe I'll try and answer that. I think it's one of, for me, one of the most fascinating parts of India, right up in the northeast and uh, near the uh, Myanmar border. Um, and most people would go November, December time, possibly around the Hornbill Festival. Uh, for me, that's a sort of a, a government construct. And I would go to Owling, which is in Easter and April. And it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like a, it's like a New Year festival for them. Uh, and everybody, even if they've, they've, they've moved away from the village, will come back to the village for that, for those three or four days. Uh, and it, and it, it's a magical time, but I think it's a, it's very, it's very hilly, it's very different, it's got a very interesting history, uh, even from its neighbours next door to Assam, etc. But uh, if you want to find out more about Nagaland, uh, then please give us a call in the, in the office tomorrow. Um, staying uh, on the subcontinent, um, Sally, oh, but, but jumping across the sea, Sally, do you want to say a little bit about Sri Lanka, if, if you may? Yeah, um, Sri Lanka, um, obviously less populated, but we hope slightly ahead of the curve in terms of a sort of return to our new normal um, than India will be. Um, they are not issuing visas at the moment, but um, the plan was that with a positive COVID test, you could then, you have to have one on arrival and then you can go on and travel, but you do have to have tests along the way. We were really hoping it would open in November, but as I may have mentioned briefly earlier there's some thought that it will, won't be until the new year i think i mean i'm a big fan of sri lanka i'm a big fan of india as well but i do love uh, i love the sort of neatness of sri lanka and the variety of it and you know you can be in misty tea hills one day and some gorgeous villa down on the beach the next day um but um yeah we just hope to see it open up sooner rather than later ideally they really do have a lot of um, tourism over Chinese New Year in February, so fingers crossed that we'll, they'll get a winter season. Um, yeah, beautiful, absolutely fabulous. I mean, a small place, it's like it's the size of Ireland, and you've got elephants and tea and food and leopard. I mean, it really is. A, it's, a, it's a fabulous destination, great for families. Um, I'd, I'd highly recommend it, having been two or three times myself. Great, thank you. I'm um, staying in the subcontinent, Pakistan. Pakistan is somewhere that is back online, is it not, JK, at the moment? Um, yes, yeah, it is. And um, Virgin have just started flying to Pakistan. Um, I think, you know, given that the American network is somewhat uh, limited at the moment, they've just announced they'll be flying to Pakistan. But yes, they, they're, they're opening up their borders to tourism. Yeah, it still remains one of my favourite destinations. Uh, some 25 years ago, I was lucky enough to spend uh, quite a few months there. Uh, traveling around, I think the the free son of Peshawar, Chitral, uh, the wonders of Hunza, the, the Karakoram Highway, just the 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 awe of staring up at this the mountain Rakaposhi. Um, it's somewhere that's very close to my to my heart, um, and I would love to say more about it. But I think what we'll do is, um, and Rosalind McCarthy was asking about us covering the Silk Road. Uh, I think it's something that we will do perhaps later in October or maybe early November. Um, uh, a webinar on a bit more on Central Asia on the Silk Road uh, and one one route to the Silk Road is coming uh, uh, across um, from Xinjiang from China into uh, Pakistan on the Karakoram Highway. Um, the other slide I think the perhaps penultimate slide that we have is on um, Uzbekistan. 
Uh, and again, when I was in Pakistan, I remember reading Peter Hopkins' uh, wonderful book, The Great Game, uh, which starts with uh, two British officers um, in 1841, uh, Stoddart and Connolly, languishing in the cells of the Emir of Bukhara. And uh, Uzbekistan is filled with this, this, this intrigue and these wonderful, wonderful cities, the uh, Samarkand and the Registan. Um, but it's, it, it's much more than that. You've got uh, destinations like Kyrgyzstan, this wonderful mountainous destination. The Palmas are hard, hard work in terms of walking, but it's great. But um, as I said, I think that that's something we'll leave to um, uh, later in the year, end, end of October, November, to come back to more in Central Asia uh, and the Silk Road. Um, I think that we, we have some questions come in. So Stu was asking a, a question about uh, my, my comment about the smiles of people and whether you'd be able to see the smiles of people because of face masks. Um, and I think in short, that, uh, perhaps, sim I don't know if either, either of you want to uh, comment on this, but perhaps similar to here, uh, in this country, uh, when you're outside, that you don't necessarily have to wear uh, a face mask. Um, it's, it's more perhaps if you're in a market or a concentrated place that you, you would have to have to wear a face mask. Um, also, just to sort of point out that face masks have been long, long worn in Asia. Um, it, it's nothing new to them. In, in Japan, it's considered extremely bad manners to not wear a face mask if you've got a cold. It's done very much with that in mind. It's done for others. It's not done for yourself. In Thailand, um, the pollution causes people to wear, I mean, I'm talking Bangkok, causes people to, it, to wear face masks. So it's the norm there. Um, and also you can tell if somewhere like Thailand or Indonesia, the smile is in their body language and in their eyes, you're still going to get that absolute warmth, that sort of, that virtual hug that you get when you're in Asia. You, you, you know, yes, you'll see the smile um, sort of out and about, but it is the norm for people in Asia to wear face masks in the city. So for them, but yeah, you'll still, you'll feel it. You can't escape it. Great answer, Sally. Great answer. Thank you. Um, Stu Freeman's just asked about, uh, we didn't mention Southern Pakistan, the Sindh and Punjab. Um, I know that Paul Craven, uh, one of our Asia travel experts, who's been with us some 25, six years, um, has, was there last year. And uh, not, again, not for the first time, but went back there last year uh, and absolutely loved it. And that's why I think we'll wait till uh, October, November, and when Paul and um, Paul can tell us more about uh, parts of the Silk Road um, and and Southern Pakistan. Um, there was another Before question. Just going to say we've got um, group tours, a group tour to Pakistan next year um, that, that covers quite a big chunk of the country, south and north, um, as well as Nagaland as well. I meant to say earlier, um, we've got a group tour to Nagaland next year. So do um, do contact us. So we can give you more details about those tours if, if they're of interest. Great, thank you for that. Um, there was a question um, earlier on from Simon Cross about FCO travel advice um, and uh, whether one can travel uh, when there's FCO travel advice uh, or negative advice in place uh, and about insurance. And again, I'm happy to take that, but if either of you, I don't know, want to say something on that. I think um, there is a misconception that because the Foreign Office advises against travel, then all travel insurance policies will be invalid. Um, as I say, it is a misconception. That isn't the case. You need to check with your insurer. And there are some good insurers out there. Campbell Irvine is, is, a, is a broker that we work with um, who will still give you cover, but they may not give you cover for the reason the Foreign Office is advising against travel. Um, having said that, Campbell Irvine's new policy does provide a huge amount of cover um, related to COVID-19. So as with anything, I think it's a case of shopping around, um, looking, you know, come to us for advice um, and, um, you know, don't listen to, to what a lot of the media is saying. I'm afraid they're wrong. You can still travel to a country that advises where the Foreign Office advice is against travel. Um, you just need to check with your insurance provider as, as to what um, impact that has on your cover. Thank you for that. Um, th there was a comment earlier on about uh, one of my opening comments about sort of the government's lack of strategy. And I was referring more to travel terms uh, and the travel industry. We've been trying to meet with Kelly Tolhurst until yesterday. She was the Minister of Transport. Uh, and one of the things we're trying to do is get this decoupling of the Foreign Office advice from, from COVID related at the moment so that the FCO advice goes back to being more security based and uh, um, as opposed to health and COVID. Uh, and that's one of the key things that 
we, the travel industry and the insurance world, want from the government at the, at the moment. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's any other questions coming through, but is there anything that either of you want to either pick up on that, that I, either I've said or each other has said in terms of some of the destinations that we, we've covered? There was one thing, I know there's a few questions coming in about um, Tigers, and I meant to say, do speak to us about the all-day permits you can get for the national parks in, in, in Madhya Pradesh. Places like Bandargar, Kana, Pench, I think Pana also. Um, you can pay for an all-day permit, um, and that gives you pretty much free roaming throughout the park. Um, without it, you are quite restricted in the terms of the hours that you go in and the route that you follow. So, you know, it's, it's not cheap, but I can tell you it is absolutely worth every rupee. It gives you such value to really just have free roaming around the parks all day, which is um, a really rare treat. Great, thank you. And just one thing on, on Tigers and Tiger Parks. Again, the best time of year to go. I know that the, the parks will open normally about September, October time and sort of shut maybe April, May. But when, when's the best time for, for, to see Tiger? Yeah, so you're absolutely right. October through to sort of April. Um, March, April is, is considered to be the best time because you're right towards the end of, of the summer. Um, so the, the foliage, the cover, the natural cover that the tiger has, has in some cases died back. Um, there's less water around at that time as well. So you, it's easier for the guys to determine where the tigers may be. You know, chances are they'll be at a water hole. Um, another thing to consider, Todoba National Park that I mentioned, um, that opens pretty much I think all year round. So if you can stand the heat, and my goodness, it is extremely hot. If you go in July, June, July, um, you can actually go to Todoba. Um, and because of the reasons I've just said earlier about sort of March, April in Madhya Pradesh, you've got a really strong chance of, of seeing tigers, but um, it does require some constitution to, um, yeah, to tolerate the heat. Um, it, can, it can get pretty high. Thank you for that. Um, I don't see any other questions coming through as yet, so maybe we'll wrap up. But if, people, if anybody has any questions that we, I, or any further questions going forward, uh, please do give us a call. Um, we have a skeleton team who are, who are here in the office most days. Um, and also, uh, we've just sent out uh, a little magazine that you should be uh, with you in the post um, shortly. Um, if you don't get a copy for whatever reason, please do give us a call again. Um, but it just, well, it's for me to say a thank you um, to Jared and to Sally uh, for th their expertise, their professionalism, uh, their, their knowledge. Um, I, I'm lucky to work with such a, an experienced team. And I think that it, in these, these times, I think that experience really, really counts for something. Uh, and the contacts that we have uh, around the world to uh, be able to operate, to introduce flexible booking conditions, um, et cetera. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us on, uh, on this Wednesday evening. Uh, the sun is still out. Um, please go and enjoy it. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.